Hi, hello everyone. Um, my name is Jolanta Mozerska, and I have the pleasure to be your host at today's uh, planner discussion. Our topic will be uh, sense and marvels of a research. And um, let me introduce our panelists. So our first guest is Sarah Hooker. Sarah is a research scholar at Google Brain doing uh, deep learning research. Her main interests gravitate towards interpretability, model compression, and security. Uh, she also founded Delta Analytics, which is a nonprofit dedicated to facilitating the use of machine learning for good. Um, next, Alexandra Przegolinska. Alexandra is currently um, an associate professor at Leon Kozminski Academy and uh, the leader of AI in management program. She's interested in the development of new technologies, natural language processing, humanoid artificial intelligence, and social robots. I want also to welcome Kyle Cranmer. Uh, Kyle is a professor of physics and data science at uh, New York University. Uh, and works on the ATLAS experiment at the Large Hadron Collider. He also developed a framework that enables collaborative statistical modeling, which was used ex extensively uh, for the discovery of the Higgs boson. His current interests are at the intersection of physics, statistics, and machine learning. Um, yeah, and before we jump uh, to the questions, uh, just a short reminder, at the end of this panel, uh, we'll do a quick uh, Q&A session. So please write your questions in the Q&A tab. Um, that should be uh, at the right side of your screen. Um, so yeah, uh, let's start with a short question. Um, what do you think uh, is the cardinal sin? of AI research. Um, maybe let's start with Sarah. I mean, it's a short question, but it has quite the punch. <laughs> um, I guess that question could be rephrased as like, what, what do I, am I most grumpy about right now? I think one of the trickiest part about AI research right now is that we don't have a good way to value work that is uh, a, is more exploratory. So our publication system is fairly tricky uh, right now in terms of the incentive structure is not well set up for exploration. And this is not particular to machine learning. I think this is more to do with the industrialization of science as a whole, but this has implications for what questions we explore, uh, the appetite for risk and for exploring different directions. And I think ultimately it does a disservice to the field because we end up with fairly saturated subdirections, um, where, where there's with other directions which actually could have meaningful um, uh, stepwise leaps in performance being allocated less resources. So that's one of the biggest ones. Um, and maybe I'll stop there because I want to see what, what other people say. So uh, feel free to jump in, Kyle or Alexandra. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe Alexandra, what do you think? Oh, I, I mean, I agree, but just not to repeat what Sarah said, I maybe ask a question, what is AI research? In fact, I think it's a very broad term uh, that can be problematic too, uh, especially when you think about the context of uh, something, I guess we could call fake AI research or like a research that really does not touch upon AI fundamentals or doesn't develop the field, um, but uh, sort of, uh, but creates a lot of confusion. And I think it's a tricky subject, uh, but it is tricky really to define, I think, artificial intelligence today. To some people, this definition is very clear, but yet to others, it's kind of more vague and embraces many other kind of disciplines of, of knowledge. So I, I think this is, maybe it's not a pain point, maybe it can be a challenge, it can also be an opportunity, but it is hard, right? What counts as AI research and um, especially, I mean, you know, uh, we're talking here about research that can be understood as something that is performed within the academic setting or like uh, research setting per se in uh, an R&D lab, but AI research can be understood very broad. And um, I, I mean, I do encounter situation where 
somebody, let's say, performs a linear regression model for income prediction and says that this is AI research. I guess it can be, uh, I guess it could be uh, considered AI research, but does it really contribute to the discipline or is it just an application of an existing uh, methodology? I think that can create some confusion. Um, in the Polish context, I could say, because I kind of function in both spending half of my year in the US, the other half in Poland, I often uh, encounter another like um, sort of pain point uh, that I find really problematic is that uh, sort of where to apply uh, for funding. For instance, when you think about the structure of the Polish academia, quite often it's very hard when you're working on a project, let's say an NLP, that by the way is a saturated field, I think in AI, but essentially um, I, I work in this field and quite often I face a problem of um, the impossibility of categorization of which panel, scientific panel, I should apply to with this grant. Because if something is interdisciplinary, and AI per se kind of is, um, that can create problems. Uh, it can create, as I said before, opportunities, but also problems. So I think AI is a broad discipline that is somewhere like allocated between many different other disciplines. And then kind of, I'm never sure whether I should apply to the linguistics, uh, you know, if I'm, for instance, applying AI in the field of management, I work in a business school that, that maybe I should think about organizational studies or should I apply to engineering's department? I find that to be a bit of a problem. And I know that this is a problem also encountered by other teams that are uh, conducting similar research to the uh, one I am conducting. So uh, maybe that would be just number two and I'm assuming there are plenty others, but yeah, maybe Kyle can take over now. Um, yeah, I, I, when I first started thinking about this question, I, I, the first things that came to mind were more specific things. And one of them was that I think, you, you know, a lot of the big successes you see in AI will be, you know, early on was around image and images and then, you, you know, natural language processing, et cetera. And I think that somehow it, it sort of shapes the scope of what people think of as AI research, which is much, much broader. And I think that it goes back to this point of saturation. Um, I think that gives the impression that, you know, sometimes people think that things are farther along in terms of sort of general purpose AI than, you know, maybe they are. And then when I sort of asked myself, you know, like, what is the root cause of all of this? I, I did also get back to uh, what I wrote to myself was that the publishing model is not aligned with what real progress in AI looks like. And I think it's very similar to what Sarah is saying. And that if you look at places where, you know, things are successful, um, you know, the the evolution, of, it's not like one paper that's responsible. I mean, there may be, there are breakthrough papers, but it's overall, it's a, a, a community effort that grows with more time. And the, the way that the contribution, I think we would like to see more atomic contributions and more of a web of scientific literature, you know, uh, talking about, you know, what the, you know, whether they're experiments or implementations or theoretical advances. And, and see it more of a kind of a, a tissue of, of a body of work as opposed to like somehow here's the big breakthrough paper, which is largely how the incentive structure is aligned right now. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your different opinions. Um, okay, so moving on to the next question. Um, I've noticed that um, many of um, talented people around me uh, end up working on issues that are more um, commercial than scientific, for example, um, targeting advertisements. So my question is, um, what can we do to draw their attention to more pressing issues? And I'm talking about uh, like socially relevant applications um, of machine learning or research in general. Uh, Sarah, what's your opinion? I think there's actually various aspects to that question. So I don't think uh, working on uh, applied issues like ads is, uh, I, I, I think it's actually a really interesting problem. Uh, I myself, before Bray and I worked on recommendation systems and I found it fascinating and it has all these implications for how uh, data is used, but also um, it's really good, particularly if you're getting started, it's a, a really excellent training ground for understanding things like what is the minimal model that is sufficient for a task? Because deployment settings are so different from how we think in research, where we abstract away deployment and we abstract away the data pipeline and we assume all our data is curated. 
And often that's naive in a different way. So I, I never, I always recommend actually that um, a good balance of having applied experience and research experience can really inform your perspective. I think there's another aspect to your question though, of what applied problems are we working on? And so for example, if we think about um, problems where there are um, returns that are tangible, like metrics that we can track, those tend to receive a lot of attention. So we tend to have very, very well optimized recommendation systems. But if it's a metric which is not well quantified, like how do we uh, how do we combat climate change issues using machine learning, or how do we think about uh, improvements in human welfare using machine learning? Uh, we typically face, I would say, two problems. One is that uh, I think one thing machine learning researchers are not very good at is consulting with domain experts. <laughs> we tend to have a little bit, we, we tend to have a little bit of reluctance to be humble. So I suspect part of it is that we actually need to connect more with people on the ground who are working in these different domains and um, leave for a second this our, our, our tendency to, to say, well, a deep neural network will solve it and actually go and see and scope the problem better. But the second is the metric issue. So you humans very much live within a system. And I think that what I've seen most often with where this has struggled, incentivizing applied work that has beneficial changes that everyone says they want it, but there's not the reward system created to actually endorse it. I'll give a great example. So there's a researcher who's doing a PhD right now and one of the first um, PhDs, which is focused on data for social good. She is frankly having a miserable time. And the reason why is that she's trying to fit that PhD within a rubric that was created for people who are doing machine learning conferences. And it is tough because that she is graduating with a PhD in computer science. So she is being compared to her peers, but that type of work doesn't fit into that rubric, mainly because our conference system doesn't reward applied work. Um, it's not seen as novel in the lens that we often think about algorithmic improvements or contributing um, uh, to, uh, to different aspects of uh, theory. And what I would say is that also has to change. If we think this work is valuable as a community, we have to also articulate how. And things like the NeurIPS data set and benchmark track is a very important step in that direction, where we actually create dedicated tracks to reward this type of research. But it has to go further as well. I mean, Alexandra mentioned grants. Uh, we need to see more grants that are explicit for yeah. this type of work. Um, so I'm going to pause there. So let me open up. I would love to hear what uh, everyone else thinks. Mm -hmm. Wow, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would also tend to think that the problem is not in the distinction between applied research and something we could call fundamental research, but the, the problem is really whether it's beneficial or not, because you can well combine applied uh, research that could uh, be something we would consider AI for good, whatever that means. And, and, and uh, well, I mean, that depends on the scope of your question. I do think also that comes back to the previous question that certain domains of AI are really like uh, densely filled with projects and there's a lot going on. There are some others that are not so well developed and uh, well, um, for instance, to me, it's, it's quite interesting that there are so many people uh, working in image processing or NLP, like we were saying before, for instance, robotics or embodied robotics, if you will, is such an interesting domain and there is so much program, progress to be done. They're both, I'd say, fundamental and applied. And we we kind of see less of that. So there is, uh, that, that, that's one thing, right? Whether we can, to, um, to any extent, try and, and, and see more balance in that in the future, where more disciplines are covered, because I'm quite sure that if we work on all of them, we will see interesting overlaps that we cannot see yet, because well, uh, some of them are just simply not yet developing. So maybe uh, th that would be one thing. But the other is that, for instance, so I teach at a business school in Warsaw, and we've always specialized in business, and thus uh, we're quite applied and very practical. And the students that we have in my program in AI and management are students who are mostly interested in application, right? So they want to take um, the methodology that they learn. They want to take AI, machine learning, deep learning, to uh, business cases. 
Now, to me, it's interesting also how uh, they will develop in terms of thinking about their own responsibility, you know, how to design an unbiased model, how to take care of quality uh, data so that their process is a um, per se kind of a, an ethical process and that also some of their work in the future which will be applied is also uh, applied to domains that desperately uh, need it like climate change like sarah said right or like public health for instance these are issues that we require our expertise i'm quite sure that ai can only be beneficial there are mostly beneficial so to me i guess that the problem is not really it w w what lands in applied or fundamental but rather you know, in terms of subdisciplines of AI, how well they're they're covered. Uh, obviously, you cannot steer that process, uh, and that's probably good. It's more emergent, but to some extent, I I, I would want to see more people in, in some of these domains, and also whether um, the consciousness of of you know ethical approach to this general purpose technology that is really big it, is there. You know, and uh, that also when it comes to your goals. Um, you can apply for a grant, um, let's say, in, um, in in climate crisis, tackling the climate crisis through the usage of AI, and that there will be funds for you, like 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 Sarah like Sarah said. So yeah, that's kind of my way of thinking about it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. I, have, I have some thoughts, maybe that. Um, so you know, partially in, in my work, I you know. I originally a, a physicist, and so there's a part of you know the, the work that has this applied setting, and there's a lot of time spent trying to engage with the machine learning community to try to you know get them to work on some scientific problems, and so uh, and over the last several years, I've you know done a, a fair amount to try to like foster the 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 you know the the community that would be using machine learning in the context of like say the physical sciences, and I think that what I found in in that process is that. The, the discussions also often framed like we, we were kind of just hearing is on one side you have research on fundamental topics and then you have applications and i think in some sense one of the issues that we have is that framing uh that uh not that i disagree with that there's there's fundamental research and, and applications but you know applications gets pretty removed from research and so people are not really generally submitting papers to you know research conferences on like pure applications and it tends to be more aligned with you know where there are jobs and money and things like that and and that's often not on these issues like climate and so you know ml for social good so if you want to try to improve that i think part of it is we need to like try to reframe it a little bit and one of the ways that you can reframe it that i found to be like one of the most successful is and there's a phrase that goes along with it which is called use inspired research and the idea is that instead of it being pure, pure, you know, like fundamental research that is, you know, not thinking about applications or pure applied research, you you sort of contextualize your fundamental research in some application setting. And and almost always, when you really get into it and you start working with domain experts and things, you start realizing what's different about this than you know the last ImageNet challenge, right? Um, and in the case of particle physics, you know, originally I tried to recruit people to work on problems by saying, you know, it's the Higgs boson and, you know, this, you know, fundamental, you know, nat you know, study of nature and people think it's exciting, but they did not decide to spend their time on it. And uh, there are lots of other interesting things. There's cancer and all these other things to work on. And, you know, so when, but later when I was able to articulate uh, what's interesting about particle physics data and symmetries, the structures of the data, what's missing from a machine learning point of view, and where the opportunities are from a research pers like research perspective, it was able to start getting a lot of people, you know, engaged. So I think, um, so in some sense, you know, this is in coming kind of from the the other areas. The other areas need people that are that can translate well and identify what's interesting from a research perspective and start to try to articulate that and then build up that community. I think that's pretty uh, important for uh, trying to get engagement. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. I just wanted to add something to what Carl's saying because it's so important, which is that I actually think applied constraints have a lot to offer research. Often with we abstract away and we make various assumptions, but the the severe constraints that you often face when you're trying to actually apply it to a problem, a lot of research breakthroughs have come from those type of constraints. And I think that we're wrong to um, to, to silo it so much. So some of the best ideas emerge when you have this type of uh, what, you, what you were describing, the fusion of the two. Um, so yeah, that okay. resonates. Yeah, I would also say that you need like um, 
kind of a proper environment for that. Uh, for instance, again, it feels like um, maybe not in Central Europe, but in, in Poland, those patterns of um, well understood kind of collaboration between researchers and industry. Well, we're, we're getting there, but we're not quite yet there. And I can give you an anecdote from our own work. Um, where I, I kind of still think that um, within certain constraints and uh, understanding, you know, how well an industrial problem is something that should be solvable and essentially, you know, there's real data out there. It's not too theoretical, not too abstract. It's actually well linked and everything. I do remember like um, talking to, um, you know, one of the representatives of the industry who wanted to uh, give us a grant. Uh, about the process, that the process is essentially still very scientific. So, I mean, I do understand and I appreciate the concerns, yet I, I have to stress that uh, what we're going to do does not guarantee success and we need iterations and um, some attempts and uh, that can be a value as well. And what I have heard was that, no, it's not a, not a value. Actually, we, we just have five months and this has to be done. So, can you guarantee? that it will be done. And I, I think this attitude, I'm nah, not sure to what extent that's represented across many different sectors. I can definitely see how, um, because of, you know, the risk and investments, particularly for like medium, small enterprises that would like to conduct some sort of research in partnership with science, that can be a problem. But I do think that, uh, you know, best practices and this type of collaboration are, are still much needed in the sense that um, uh, those constraints can be very good. But then again, um, kind of the understanding has to be sort of mutual here that uh, it is still a, a process of discovery. And therefore, it's, uh, you know, a journey into the unknown. So I, I kind of feel that this is also something that when it comes to applied research is um, sometimes, yeah, missing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, now I want to ask you a question um, connected to uh, what you already mentioned uh, in climate change. Um, because I'm curious, uh, what do you think about carbon footprint in the context of machine learning? Um, because let's suppose that uh, we evaluate a research paper and uh, should we uh, take into account um, the carbon footprint of the proposed model? um what what do you think about that maybe uh let's start with kyle it, it's a good it's a good question i mean i i i guess on my first answer is sort of of course we should take it into account it's just kind of a question of how i i like sort of the idea that people actually report on such things uh it, you know um there are many other things that you could refer to in terms of cpu hours and etc that's i think really important information for trying to like put it in context especially like sarah was talking about some of the research people aren't really thinking about when you actually go to deploy it and etc um i do also wonder a little bit um you know i'm not an expert on this topic and i've seen sort of conflicting information but you know, we, we should ask ourselves what is the actual scale you know of, of these carbon emissions it's certainly true that uh, some of some of you know the th big headline research that you see requires an enormous amount of compute. Um, you know, if you compare that to something like Bitcoin mining or something, it maybe it's it's super tiny. Or, or you know, people compare it to air travel and things. And I, um, but you know, so I one thing that I worry a little bit is um, since many people are sensitive and should be sensitive to this topic, that it, it if it gets an outsized representation, if it, if, and I'm not saying it is, but if it's not as big of an issue as some people want to make it to be, you can really use that to manipulate research. And and I, I do sometimes wonder, you know, since AI is, you know, has there's people that are worried about national security and like large multinational corporations and things. I sometimes wonder to what degree that narrative is being manipulated uh, to try to push the research around. So. Um, so I have a little bit of skepticism, but of course it's an important topic. The thing that I'm more worried about there is really about uh, equity and access. And if all of the machine learning research requires, you know, a compute budget that only a very small fraction of the research community has, uh, that that has very detrimental effects. And that I think is a very serious topic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um... Sarah, Alexandra, uh, do you want to, to take this question? Sarah, go ahead. 
Oh, um, so I definitely think that this, so when we talk about um, measuring the carbon emissions of training, it's kind of this wider question, right? So what are the resources used for training? And I think that's a more interesting question because I don't think we're very good right now at tracking how many carbon emissions training actually uh, requires, mainly because it's so hardware dependent, but it's also so dependent on how you distribute and where your data centers are located. And uh, have you been clever about how you place it? So even the price of energy right now, it's very difficult to quantify. So will this become a standard that we as a machine learning community can use in a precise way? It's not quite clear yet. So whenever I think about metrics, I always think about it in terms of well, we want a metric which is granular enough that we can measure progress on and where there's a shared understanding of what it means so that it's meaningful to the community as a whole. Carbon emissions isn't quite there, but I do think the intent is very valid because what we want to really ask is, well, if we have one algorithm that is only less than a percentage better than another, but is required double the amount of whatever notion of resource we define, that is an interesting uh, interesting distinction, right? So what does that mean then in terms of the 1%? And I think we're facing this more and more where we're dedicating an enormous amount of resources for ever decreasing returns. And this is a question as a community, is this, what are we actually gaining and what is the, what is the trajectory? Um, I uh, think about this a lot because there's been an enormous amount of effort within machine learning around what where we generally are calling scaling laws. But a lot of my interest is in how do we change the shape of the curve itself, not necessarily in just continuing to scale. So I think articulating, well, what really is this a sustainable trajectory when we keep on adding more and more compute and more resources is a valuable conversation to have and even better if we can anchor it to metrics because um, I'm of the <laughs> perhaps uh, unpopular opinion that it's not sustainable and that we're, we're going to have to revisit the models that we've chosen and the algorithms that we rely on in order to fundamentally achieve a more efficient uh, trade-off. Um, and that's why I think metrics are valuable, but we're not quite there yet. It doesn't make sense to ask everyone to report carbon emissions because the way people are measuring it is not yet standard. And it's highly variable by factors which most researchers can't control, like what data center their model ends up training at. And, and also uh, we could ask about what kind of energy source does this data center use? And that's yet another uh, layer of questions that we could ask. I mean, I'm not going to repeat uh, the arguments because I think both Sarah and Kyle really explained it very well, but I'm asking myself a question is, um, apart from uh, being, um, you know, the, the, the leader of the program, I'm also responsible for ethics and social responsibility at our university. And we have many different aspects of that, right? So we have uh, SDG, Sustainable Development Goals. I could well see um, a, a question being asked, was the uh, amount of work fairly distributed among the team? Is nobody exploited? I don't know. I mean, these are like tough questions, you know, I mean, but if we want to go to future metrics um, and eradicate certain negative, let's say, patterns, also of collaboration, I can see how like, you know, you have so many challenges uh, posed by the, or like, uh, let's say, you have certain challenges formulated as sustainable development goals that we, we should strive to achieve and uh, um, net zero emissions and neutrality is one of them and it's important, it's, it's crucial, but there are some others related to cohesion, to representation, to ethics, right? And I do see how all of these metrics could be developed into something that is really useful and helpful, but I can also see how they could become easily manipulated. And um, I, I do think that there will be a point where we will be able to redefine that. I would frankly be quite happy about that. Maybe that would help with the issue that we discussed previously around the topics of beneficial AI. Maybe it would be easier kind of to, to develop this sort of research. There would be more funding available, more, more opportunities. But I'm also thinking about the purpose of research, right? So you cannot decontextualize anything just solely by, by metrics, I think. So uh, um, our students recently developed plugins for Minecraft to build, um, out of Minecraft to build EchoCraft. So um, 
the type of Minecraft where you can uh, install solar panels on the walls of a buildings built in Minecraft so that you actually understand better how that could work in real life, right? So that, that kind of the, the plugin allows you to calculate how much energy you're saving. And per se, this game is obviously more energy consuming and the development of that plugin was also a cost, but the purpose I think is okay. Uh, and so like, that is to me also very important. Maybe we can just rethink what is it that we could identify as important aspects of the research, how it was conducted, where and what conditions, you know, um, and a carbon footprint could be one of the parameters here, but also the purpose. If there is a research on, on, on cancer that is energy consuming, would we still want to do it? Even with, you know, perhaps imperfect algorithms that we have, probably yes. Uh, and, and, and um, even though I'm, I'm very supportive of it, I, I think it has to be like a more be potentially like, I, I think problematic. Mm, okay. Wow. Thank you for, for all of uh, your opinions on the topic. Uh, wow. It's, uh, it is over overwhelming almost. Um, so, um, if not evaluate um, our models uh, under like carbon footprint, um, then do you see any like other issues in the process of reviewing research papers? And uh, if so, how can we address um, these issues? Um, Kyle, this is a question for you. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I think there's a, there's a, there's a lot of issues. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, we could go, we could go on and on. I think one of the, one of the ones that's pretty obvious to me, especially coming from, you know, primarily from a different domain originally is that the conference type system is large, especially right now, since there's just so, so much activity and so many papers, it's largely aimed to be a filter. It's like trying to be as efficient of a filter as possible. You have, you know, 10,000 papers submitted, you need to get down to 2000 papers as kind of quickly as possible. And, um, and so, you know, there is a, there is a kind of a round of where you can kind of, uh, you know, uh, make an appeal to the to the reviewers about what they didn't understand or what you'll fix or something like that but the process overall is not designed to kind of ensure some level of baseline quality and to improve the overall quality of the research it's much more uh, you know organized as a filter and i think most you know scientific journals and things like that even though i have issues with a lot of the journals you know at least the process is much more iterative and the, and the kind of trying to make it better and then also to ensure that there's some kind of baseline level of quality. So that's that's one issue that I have. And um, the other thing that I, I, I mentioned it a little bit earlier is that um, a lot of times, you know, the, the, the papers, they, they're kind of expected to have a good motivation, um, you know, have some new novel algorithm or something and that uh, have uh, really good experiments, really good results. Hopefully you also have a, an implementation that's reproducible um, and then also some theoretical analysis of the, you know, I mean, you're asking for a lot, you know, uh, uh, and, and it's all packaged up and one, it's supposed to be in one paper. Um, and, you know, eventually if, the, you know, whatever is being proposed is going to actually, you know, happen and have, you know, impact, you would hope to see all of that, right? But if you look at, you know, areas where there has been success, I don't know, just like generative adversarial networks, you know, they first came out, there was a, like a kind of simple idea at the beginning there was an implementation that produced impressive results. I guess later you found out that there's actually kind of a bug in the original paper and it still worked, but you know, then lots of people try to reproduce it. People start realizing how, how finicky training a generative adversarial network is. People start coming up with new ideas. There's a bunch of different implementations. And then through time, there's enough people that have re reproduced a bunch of really impressive results that it kind of becomes established as this is an important thing. There's a bunch of variants and then, uh, um, and that process, I think, is, is is the real process, but the the publication model is not, you know, tied to that evolution. I think what would be much more healthy is if you had people that had, uh, you know, like the the benchmark data. Set, like here are here are a bunch of example experiments uh, that where that where you sort of uh, and you know said ahead of time what kind of experience experiments you wanted. You know, here is a, another uh, independent implementation 
of this of this algorithm that's nicely documented and can be reused and reused in the context of those experiments. Um, you have people that you know do theoretical analysis, people that provide really nice uh, motivation and things like that. I think that that more atomic style contribution would be would be helpful, and it requires like a, a major shift in how like just the research is conducted and how the incentives look. So it's not easy to get there. Um, but uh, you know, I, I know that when I you know, when I was first starting to get more active in machine learning research, uh, you know, it was very different from physics, where in physics, the idea is somehow like, you know, cherished. And, and then a lot of the implementation is kind of like, okay, whatever. Uh, but, you know, people remember whoever came up with some idea and, and some flash of insight. And that has its own problems. You know, that has this kind of hero worship problem and things like that. Uh, but it's also true that like after generative adversarial networks happen, people don't remember the specific experiments or the implementation, people kind of remember this flash of insight. And so we do need to, you know, recognize that the, these, you know, flashes of insight that happen along the way are valuable. Um, and also, I think that, you know, when we look at issues around diversity, and broadly, um, you know, you're not, there's very few people that are going to have, you know, in, insightful vision, really good, you know, technical skills, really good mathematical skills. And if you start asking all of these things, it's, 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 um, you know, it's not going to foster an inclusive environment. I feel like having people that can really excel in different aspects of it and recognizing those contributions will help overall. Um, so in addition to like streamlining the research progress, I think it will help the community from that point of view. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, do you have like anything uh, to add to this? Nope. I thought that was <laughs> very, yeah, I'm, I'm grumpy about it. I don't think we're doing a good job right now. Um, but I think Kyle depicted some of the problems very well. So I rest my case. <laughs> Alexandra? Um, I just perhaps focus a bit on, on the first um, uh, part of what Kyle said about um, more collaborative environment, perhaps. Uh, I'd welcome less conferences that show final results and actually more of those that are focused on work in progress to build more collaborative environments for actually, you know, developing a better research. Uh, in my academic like, career, I think the most helpful uh, situations uh, were when I was like with an unready, like, draft, let's say, of my research, and I had a community of people who helped me out with at an early stage, in the middle of it, and then when I was finalizing it, right? So, I, I it felt like a good process then. Uh, and um, it is true, I think, that systemically, we are in the filter mode, uh, and essentially, you know, um, the, 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 the review is about selection, and it's not about improvement. So, I, I think, that's a, that's something that could be done quite easily. That's that's not a hard thing to do. To just kind of reformat uh, events, conferences, review processes into something that essentially is more collaborative. Shows you certain directions, uh, how to develop the paper, maybe where to submit your work, uh, how to find collaborators potentially whom you don't know, so you don't reach out to them. I, I would think that we can definitely make um, research more collaborative on large scale and on a local scale, and that's something I would I would definitely uh, welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for all of your answers. Um, I think uh, we now. Um, I think we should move to the Q and A um, session, uh, and I see that we have uh, even dedicated questions to to our guests. Um, so, yeah, uh, first question would be to Sarah. Um, nowadays, it is hard to publish paper about new methods that results in worse performance than the baselines. Do you think? Uh, that it will change? So, I think that there's periods to scientific discovery. So, there's periods of something, an insight is unlocked, and then there's almost a feast phase <laughs> where you exploit that insight in many different ways. And then there's what I would call a famine stage where 
you've saturated that insight and there's more appetite for exploration because you're trying to find the next big insight. I would say that's where we are with deep learning research or specifically like, you know, broader machine learning research. We've had deep neural networks since 2011 and a lot of the last decade has been really, really exploring using this representation type in many, many different ways. And I do think that we're now entering a stage where there's going to be more tolerance for revisiting fundamentally ways of representing the world and um, for bigger leaps. But I will say during the feast phase, it's very hard <laughs> because you have a combination of people are taking this one idea, but moving very quickly on it. So our iteration pace has been very quick. But because of that, there's been an overfitting to certain benchmarks. So if you think about what we've really used for the last decade, you can probably list it on two hands, the data sets that have been very, very popular across multiple subfields. And that's one of the things that I think we'll see revisited more. So why have we relied on ImageNet so much? We know that there's huge issues with ImageNet and even how we've structured it for a single image classification task. Um, and there, I think that we will be more forgiving of fundamentally new approaches that try and do different things, may not get the same performance, but are at least doing something new. Um, uh, typically, we've reserved that forgiveness for things like capsule networks, where the, the authors have enough gravitas, maybe, to, to prod us all to consider it. But I, I think that when you get to this more less of a bounty stage, we do tend to encourage different subfields again. We tend to relook at something like uh, geometric approaches to deep learning, or uh, we, we even uh, ponder causal frameworks, which, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, won't, I won't stake my next decade on that, but I think there's at least, there's at least uh, more of an appetite for risk. And that's where I'm optimistic. I think we'll, you know, we will be more indulgent. Um, okay, I hope that it, it answers the question. Um, okay, uh, now we have a question uh, for Kyle. Um, assuming that uh, one is a specialist in machine learning, how much does he has to know about physics to do effective research with applying machine learning to physics? That's a good question. Uh, I think, I mean, there is certainly a number of, uh, of uh, sort of applications where uh, where I don't think you necessarily need to know uh, that much about physics. There have been more and more physicists that have you know gotten better at being able to explain uh, explain the problem and, and appreciate the the potential for machine learning that you know things are kind of curated in a way so that uh, people can step in. Uh, but hopefully, then that engagement turns into something more, and that uh, because I think there's a you know a huge potential for the sort of use inspired research where the the character of the the problems that you see in physics give rise to new ideas and i think you know in the in the process of of uh of collaborating and interacting i think that you know hopefully would happen naturally um but it's also true that you know there is certainly a fair amount of work to be done where it doesn't necessarily require coming up with a new a, a brand new idea there's there are certainly some you know pretty much just straight uh, applied research problems where they can have real uh impact on on, on science, uh, so so there's a spectrum there of uh, really contributing directly to science to more use-inspired research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, okay, uh, let's see uh, what questions we have. Um, okay, um, uh, I guess this is a question to Alexandra. Um, uh, and, and Sarah, I guess, um, you mentioned inappropriate uh, funding for interdisciplinary projects. Imagine this is a pain point for academia. What about industry? Do you think there are such research directions are better recognized? I do think it's less of a problem, definitely, in the industry than it is in the academia. Having that said, um, obviously not all academic models are, are similar in the sense that you have models where 
uh, where you belong in terms of discipline doesn't matter all that much. I did my postdoc at MIT and over there it felt like uh, if, you're, if your research is interesting enough, we can create a discipline for you, uh, simply, you know, I mean, and you can give it a name if you want to. So it felt like more, more, more flexible that way. Um, but I do see uh, that silo. I, I think there are silos in the industry, but they are different, not in terms of names, categories, but perhaps, you know, um, certain silos of, of expertise or, or lack of discussion between experts and perhaps a lack of questions that would be formulated as, as uh, interdisciplinary questions, but they don't stem from those, um, you know, external constraints formed by science as it is often organized, I think, in Europe. So that's kind of my response to it. So I, I wouldn't say that it's, uh, it's perfect in the industry, but I think the circumstances are, are significantly different. That's kind of my response. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Kayo, Sarah, if you have anything to add, uh, feel free. Uh, no, I'm not. I think Alexandra, um, I, I think Alexandra is the one who initially brought it up, so. Uh, okay, so then um, let's see uh, what we have from our audience. Um, okay, uh, a question for Sarah. Um, you said that there are many saturated fields uh, of deep learning. How to find the, the niche? Um, I actually encourage uh, cross-disciplinary research. So I think it's riskier. So a lot of studies have shown this. So don't don't get cross at me if you're not initially rewarded for it. Um, there's a balance. So I think that participating in academia because of the pressures of uh, the industrialization of science or how certain things are awarded, it's very, very much favored the uh, narrowing of expertise. So you choose one thing and you become particularly good at it, particularly recognized for that. But it's not really the way that we do breakthroughs. I mean, research is a lot like art or um, like uh, packaging new ideas in unforeseen ways. Like you need to see the ideas and be able to uh, spot the way that they would combine. Um, and that requires sampling. I think that particularly early in your career to work across um, at least two subfields and gain a deeper expertise in both, it unlocks a lot of insights that your peers likely won't have. Um, and there's a balance. You have to uh, you have to almost be able to articulate why those fields are interesting. Kyle did a great job of that earlier, <laughs> talking about his uh, expertise in physics and then coming into machine learning. But it really is um, it, it really is the spark that often determines a lot of how science progresses. Uh, we a lot of what has slowed our progress is. Uh, uh, our tendency increasingly to silo expertise. And that's because of how the academic system has favored and rewarded um, certain uh, threads of science, but it's not necessarily what's best for progress overall. And it's not what's fun, frankly. <laughs> like I think that if you are embarking on a, a career where you want to think about ideas, make sure that the ideas that you think are interesting and that you love spending hours working on, and typically those are ideas that are doing something new. Um, and that's really found when you're taking, you know, something, some idea, and pivoting a million times. That's not that's not nearly as fun as uh, being being the person that that sees something and sees something else and has that moment where you're like, wow, this is this could be something special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Kyle, what would you say to that? I'm curious. That was a good question. Oh yeah, no, it was good. I mean, I, I yeah, I, I mean, I'm a big fan of the you know interdisciplinary work. I uh, the I you know I I agree that it's riskier. Um, you know, when I first really pivoted, uh, the first part I got very little traction, and then it started to go, and then it, it I kind of kept at it, partially because I was in a very privileged position. You know, I just got tenure, uh, and I could do it, and I liked it, um, and uh, and and then it kind of had a snowballing effect too. Like at first, it didn't really go, and then there started to be kind of a collection of 
interdisciplinary type work and people started to kind of get a better feel for like what is what's different about this and that doesn't happen right away so when you're a junior researcher and less secure and it's much more difficult um, and it would be great if uh, I think that kind of goes back to some of Alexandra's point about collaborative structures and if we could if we could do things to nurture that more I think it would be very uh, uh, beneficial for society and people have a better time and and I'll probably help uh, again with the kind of you know, the, the diversity and the, the types of people that are, are participating. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the answers. Um, so let's see, maybe we can fit it, uh, fit in another question. Mm. Okay, so maybe, um, Maybe let's uh, conclude our session with the question uh, This is pretty general, but um, do you think that the research is popular enough uh, widespread worldwide? Do, sorry, can the, do we think the research like overall AI research overall is widespread? Uh, yeah, maybe uh, let's just narrow it to, to AI research, yeah. Is it like popular enough or should we do something um, to popularize it more? I think it's popular. I actually think the issue is who participates in it. So I grew up in Africa. So a lot of um, the, the communities I interact with a lot are the, the ML communities and places that I grew up. Um, and it is really hard. It's really hard to currently join the machine learning community unless you followed a path and knew what you wanted to do from, from I guess, uh, presumably the last years of high school onwards. We don't have many entry points. And we really need to change that because we have so much of the world that's not represented in the conversation. I actually think it's one of the biggest omissions in terms of what ideas are worked on and what, what types of research we overfit to. So that's something that um, I think is really top of mind for me and has been for the last few years is how do we expand access, but also how do we make sure that ideas that come from different parts of the world are well represented, that we don't favor, um, that we don't favor um, only ideas that come from, if you think about it, like most of my colleagues are from six universities. <laughs> Which, you know, is it, 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 they're six very good universities, but um, I think that when we think about science as a whole, it can benefit a lot from having more people uh, in the room and thinking through their lens. Um, and uh, yeah, let me pause there. I'd love to hear what Alexandra and Kyle think. Well, um, I just add that. AI seems to be very popular, popular enough, I mean, as a topic, as a theme, as something that is also depicted by pop culture, something that's being discussed in, in various circles, but is AI research popular? I don't really know. I, I, I think I agree with, with Sarah. There are so many, um, I would say, degrees of accessibility in the sense that AI can be so widely used in other domains like um, um, pharmacy, like healthcare, like logistics, and all of these domain experts probably would benefit from using AI and their research could also be considered AI research, although in their respective domains. So I'd say that, you know, I mean, I'm looking at this process as a person also who works in uh, NLP and in conversational AI, I'm pleased to see how accessible some tools um, in NLP have become and how easier it is to use them for not necessarily ML experts, but also external experts who would wish to use artificial intelligence. And I would really support this direction, sort of like uh, to make it more accessible, uh, but also uh, not like requiring you to study for many years just to focus on that uh, and not do anything else, but rather to to use it as your uh, as your selected methodology or something that complements your research helps you out. And I I do think that in that respect there's still plenty to do. Yeah, um, I guess I would say I well I agree with uh, what, both what Alexandra and Sarah said uh, and. 
and in terms of you know who's participating in the conversation, that definitely uh, we have a lot to improve. Uh, is AI research popular? I mean, I think yes, so for sure. I think if, if anything, it's it, it's become so popular and it's being used as a catch-all for so many different things that it's you know it risks just kind of. Uh, it's not really clear what it means already, right? Uh, you know, the distinction between AI and ML, classical statistics, all sorts of, uh, you know, you know, techniques that people have used for for a long time, and you know, for optimal control for you know, in engineering settings, or you know, I don't know. There's a there's a tremendous body of work that you could kind of call AI these days, and uh, uh, and so on one side, I think it's good because it it brings somehow like some energy and a fresh lens to. Uh, uh, to things that have been around for for some time. Um, uh, sometimes I think it's harmful because people think that there's some new magic that's there that's going to somehow like solve all of the problems. Um, and in terms of like you know the the relationship between maybe just like generally the scientific community and and you know popular culture, you know just sticking this blanket AI word in the middle of everything, uh, I don't think is super uh, helpful. Um, and you know, a, a few years ago, you know, data science was one of the big uh, phrases that was out there, and it was, you know, what was the distinction between data science and you know applied statistics? You know, there were some aspects that were different. In some sense, it's like that. The, it just keeps marching along um, uh, in terms of what phrases we use. But I do think that as you start to use AI more, people are really thinking about these fancy, you know, kind of. Uh, you know, some of the really impressive successes and somehow think that that's going to translate broadly across uh, society. And it's not really clear how that's going to play out. Um, so I definitely think it's popular. I think uh, if anything, maybe we should uh, start to be more responsible and have start to use some more boring language again and try to add a little bit more structure to the discussion. <laughs> Okay, so it, it was an interesting way to, to end our, <laughs> our panel right. session. I mean, it's great. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess that's all we have prepared for you. Um, I want to thank our guests for your time and knowledge and opinions. Um, really, it was um, pure joy for me to, to moderate this session.